Call the state of session of city council order. Please rise for the invocation, followed by the pledge of flag. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community. During this month of March, month of March we celebrate Women's History Month. Let us remember the women that would have their mark on our community, beginning with our colonial female leaders, such as Florence Cyber, born in Nice on October 6, 1897, and is credited with developing the test for tuberculosis and perfecting the intravenous, intravenous injections. She grew up on 2nd Street. Another famous colonial lady was Elizabeth Bell Morgan, better known as Mammy Morgan. Although she passed more than 170 years ago, she left her our city a better place. The hillside just south of the city is known as Mammy Morgan Hill. On this city council, we have been blessed for several former female members, including Carol Hartman, Josie Small, Carol Heffley, Pam Panto, Sandy Volcano, and our two current members, Mrs. Rose, Mrs. Rose and Mrs. Sultana. We also remember State Representative Jeanette Riemann, who later became a state senator and was best known as an education senator because of her dedication to our public school system. Tonight, we thank all of their community service and laying the foundation for Easton's recovery. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Mr. Brown? Here. Mr. Ettinger? Here. Mr. Pinnabone? Here. Mrs. Rose? Here. Dr. Ruggles? Here. Mrs. Sultana? Here. And Mayor Panto? Here. Approval of the agenda? Move to approve. Move to approve is by Mr. Brown? Second. Seconded by Ms. Dr. Ruggles? Roll call. Mr. Ettinger? Aye. Mr. Pinnabone? Aye. Mrs. Rose? Aye. Dr. Ruggles? Aye. Mrs. Sultana? Aye. Mayor Panto? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Action on our minutes of our March 13th meeting. Mr. Pinnabone? Aye. 
Mrs. Rose? Aye. Dr. Ruggles? Aye. Mrs. Sultana? Aye. Mayor Panto? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. And Mr. Ettinger? Aye. At this time, we have the swearing in of three new police officers. Um, Chief, I'll introduce you to Chief Escalzo as our police chief. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Carl Scalzo, Chief of Police, City of Easton, 48 North 4th Street. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to be swearing in our newest officers as they begin their journey uh, with the Easton Police Department. Charles Baker, Kirsten Elios, and Ryan Bonfanti standing here to my right. These officers have committed to protecting and serving the citizens of the City of Easton. It's not a commitment that we, as a department or as individuals, take lightly. It's one that must be done with honor and integrity. All of these officers should be proud of what they have accomplished so far just in being selected to join the ranks of the Easton Police Department. During the hiring process, these officers have demonstrated that their character is beyond reproach and that they were willing to devote themselves to the safety of this community and to the citizens that they would swear here tonight to defend. To the family of these officers, I want to take a moment to thank you, to thank you for your sacrifices that you've already made as they embark on their journey in law enforcement, and to thank you for the sacrifices that they will make as you continue to support them on this journey. You should be proud of the lives that they have lived that make them eligible to stand before this council this evening, which in no small part is a reflection on the guidance that they have received from all of you along the way. I am grateful for the promised commitment to this department and to the community. As chief, I commit to providing these officers the best training, the best equipment, and the most support I can give them to give them every opportunity to be successful in this challenging profession. I wish them nothing but the best for a long, a fruitful, and a safe career. to presentation to City Council about the business recruitment strategy, Sean. And I would like to thank the uh, other police officers who came to see the in swearing in of these officers. I uh, appreciate your service. Okay. Turn this over to Sean Ziller and Director John Kingsley. Uh, thank you, Council, and good evening. Um, before we get started in the program, Sean's going to take us through kind of the data portion, and I'm going to do some opening comments, and, and we'll, we'll get into this pretty quickly. Um, a little over a year ago, we began having discussions um, in the Economic Vitality Committee of Easton Main Street, with both, which both uh, Sean and I serve on, to the effect that Easton sort of hit that point where we no longer have to accept business locations that come organically just through general interest in the city. 
we're now at a point where we can be selective and strategic about the types of businesses that we bring into the city. There is a critical mass, if you will, that we're achieving where if we can tell the story of the city through data and real economic metrics, we can compel the types of businesses we want in our community to consider the city as their next location. So we started delving into these conversations. We, we realized we needed a roadmap, um, a, a, a model um, to develop a business recruitment strategy, one that would not only offer the methodology by which we would undertake business recruitment, but actually help us determine how information would be gathered, um, how we would solicit interest in the city, the tools that we would use, um, and the roles that organizations such as our department, the Main Street Initiative, the Greater Eastern Development Partnership, and others would play in executing that business recruitment program. With this in mind, the department began to research models that have been used throughout the country. And we settled on one that came out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, it actually seems to touch most of the bases that we're trying to accomplish. It's pretty linear in its approach, and it's very detailed in terms of the activities that should be undertaken. We brought that model back to the Economic Vitality Committee of Main Street, and they embraced it and made it clear they actually wanted to be um, part of the process of actually developing the recruitment strategy itself. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is introduce Kim Kamets, the director of the East and Main Street um, Initiative, to talk a little about, bit about the EV Committee um, and its role in this process. Um, simply put, this work couldn't possibly get done without her leadership and without this committee. They're absolutely wonderful people. They're actually out here in force. Oh, I see them. Um, in about uh, the third row, the good I portion of that row is our Economic Vitality Committee. Um, and for that matter, our business recruitment strategy. These individuals not only put countless hours into deliberating the work that we've done so far, they also worked the actual you know, street you know, um, aspects of this, of trying to you know, get interaction with our businesses and with our community about the needs that they have, about their preferences in terms of business location. The list goes on. Um, dedication um, is real, and, and this could not possibly have happened without their uh, assistance with these great people and also with Kim's terrific leadership. So let me uh, let me turn it over to Kim and have her talk a little bit about the business and the economic vitality committee. Hello, Kim Kometz, 341 Reader Street. I'm the manager of the East and Main Street Initiative and have been just celebrated 18 years God bless last you. week. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> they told me I would last 18 months. So. Um, <laughs> So I just wanted to share a little bit about the role of the Economic Vitality Committee. Many of you understand that there are four active committees of the Main Street approach for all Main Street programs, and the Economic Vitality Committee is, is one of them. And the committee's ultimate purpose is to strengthen and diversify the economic base of the Central Business District. So the retention and business uh, recruitment has long been on top of the committee's goal, but from the very inception, but to do that, we had to spend years of building blocks along the way. So one of the big things it was is also the, one of the goals is to extend the life expectancy of each business that opened by providing various uh, per support systems throughout their, their lifetime. So some of the early things that we did were inventorying existing businesses and commercial spaces, providing site location assistance, developing relationships with property and business owners through things and programs such as Snowflakes for Easton, vacancy treatment projects, if you're, we'll, you will remember those a few year, more than a few years ago, creating a business assistance resource uh, packet for anyone looking at Easton, help them through the process, and also the open flag program and gift card program. So those are some of the accomplishments of the Economic Vitality Committee over the years. And then as some as you will remember, um, in the early years, businesses were coming in and maybe not even taking a full year lease. They were taking six months or leaving after one year, which ended up giving Easton a black eye. You know, people were saying on the street, well, you know, obviously Easton can't support these new businesses. There's not enough life there. And many had a belief in the future of Easton and were ready to invest and be part of it, but they may have been a little bit before their time. Um, another goal was to improve the vacancy rate in the downtown. So one of the very first vacancy rates we took in 2006-2007 was 24%. And then the economy crash in 2008 bumped us up to 26%. 
which is a little scary place to be. Um, sorry to say that we don't have a, a, a current vacancy rate uh, with with perfection to, you know, that we can take a guess at it. I'm going to guess we're somewhere about half of that number. And I think we've actually swapped with the numbers that are normal for an indoor mall. You know, that those at that time, indoor malls were running like 10%, and we were running 26%, and I do believe it's the other way around. But that is a goal of ours through this process, is to come make sure we have an accurate vacancy rate. So we're now at our place in the development where there are a few marketable, as John mentioned, commercial vacancies, and those that do open up fill quickly. The ones that are left are either ultra large or they have issues. They aren't really marketable in the state that they're in. So businesses follow people, and as we all work to bring more apartments and um, people living down here in the coming years, we know we must become a full service downtown, meeting their daily needs. We know we aren't quite there yet. We have a laundry list of, of businesses that we, we need to recruit. But with a plan in place, we can be deliberate about what we need and where we need it and provide the necessary data for both the property owners and potential business owners. And I know that I speak for the volunteers of the Economic Vitality Committee that are many that are here when I say we feel fortunate that we have developed this strong partnership and relationship with the city's DCED staff as well as Nicole Beckett at the Minor Center at Lafayette College. This work is gratifying we're, that we're finally at this place after so many years. Um, especially those who have committed a couple of decades to this work, Kurt Ely, David O'Connell, Sandy Volcano, Sandy Kennedy, and Chairperson Peter Broll, who's here tonight, because they can truly appreciate where we've come from, how far, how many little building blocks that we've made along the way to finally be at this place where we're working on a real recruitment and strategy program um, to strategy to, for recruitment and retention. And I think Sean will touch on when we reached out to many, many other communities across the state, nobody has, they're, they're all looking to us to lead the way, as it is with Easton. We lead the way a lot, right? We do. They're looking to us to, to pave the path, and that's an exciting place to be at the front of the engine. And, and um, these, these efforts are also equally important to business owners on the committee and their colleagues. We have a couple of business owners who are just so excited about this plan and are coming back and again and again to the table to share their experiences and what they're hearing on the street and what people want when they're here and their reactions to things. So we're very grateful for that. So we are at this place where we're at the meat and potatoes of what a successful Main Street program is all about, and we're grateful to be here and be working with our partners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What Kim didn't mention, and, and the Main Street program is so important to the city of Easton because it is our primary business retention vehicle um, in the city. They do an awful lot of hands-on work, a lot of technical assistance with our local businesses to keep them you know, successful in the city. What Kim didn't mention is how many years in a row were we the top Main Street program in, the, in Pennsylvania? See, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Kim, very much. Um, beyond having a ready-made or organization with the background and, and knowledge to undertake this process, we needed a partner who could actually help guide us through the model that the University of Wisconsin created. We needed a consultant. We needed someone who could actually keep us focused on the details, focused on the action items, keep the communication you know, on, on target. Um, and we're very, very lucky that we have a wonderful relationship with the Minor Center um, at Lafayette College, and, and even more so with Nicole Beckett, the Associate Director of Public Service. Um, Nicole's been absolutely instrumental in this whole process. She has led us from the very beginning to where we stand, and we'll get into the details of what we've accomplished so far in just a few minutes. Um, I wanted to give um, Nicole an opportunity to kind of just mention what the Minor Center does because the work they do, a lot of people aren't familiar with it, and it's an amazing organization, and Nicole is a terrific leader, so we're really lucky to have her involved in our program. She's also really passionate about this subject matter. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So I'm Nicole Beckett. Um, I'm the Associate Director for Public Service at Lafayette at the Minor Center for the Study of State and Local Government at Lafayette College. Um, by career, I spent 22 years in the field in local government, working from a temporary clerk to ultimately a borough manager um, for 12 years. 
So I came to the center in May of 2022, and it's been an absolute pleasure. At the center, what we do is we're, we have two purposes in our mission. The fir first is to educate students on the importance of local government and get them involved through internships or volunteerism and connecting with community. And the second is we provide programs, services, and trainings to local government, um, strategic planning, organizational analysis, executive recruitments constantly, that's where I'm coming from now, um, and we're all over the four county region in addition to the Lehigh Valley. So what we do is we use my skill set as a municipal manager out in the field to assist local governments to be more effective and efficient. Um, so I spent a lot of my time on the road and along with being on campus and I was fortunate enough within the first, I think, month and a half on the job, the team had come to the office looking for help. Um, they were hoping to get Professor Kincaid, the director of the center involved, till the end of the meeting learned of my background and being in municipal management and um, asked for my involvement. Economic development just happens to be my passion project. So it's brought a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, drive to the table in addition to connecting our resources on campus to this team. Um, in my municipality, I was starting a Main Street program from the bottom up. So we were just getting, we were just getting there. Um, and to see 17 years of consistency, the volunteers that have been involved, and then this A team that you have, it's just been an absolute honor. So beyond the business recruitment strategy, you know, I hope that you know that we're here as a resource and available for whatever it is that you will need. That is all. Second Thank you for Thank having you, Nicole. me. Thank you, And it's, Nicole, it's one of the things um, that the public doesn't see much, uh, the partnership with the colleges, it goes very, very deep, and we thank you for your involvement. Yeah, and, I, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, Chelsea Maurice's um, role um, in working with us on the business recru recruitment strategy as well from the Landis Center. Um, she's been wonderful in helping us um, get student talent to assist us with a variety of tasks associated with this. So we really thank La Lafayette for all of their support. They've been fantastic. So. Um, what have we done to date? Let's, so let's talk real quickly about those things. First of all, we created a business recruitment strategy. Again, it's the Economic Vitality Committee. A number of the people we've already mentioned, the list is before you. Um, you know, I know Peter is here. Um, Aaron Deutsch from the Greer Lehigh Valley Chamber is not with us. Kurt, I know, is also here, a resident and a, um, and, and a consultant in the city. Erica Fisher, our owner of Yellow Balloon Consignment. Sandy Kennedy from Fidelity Bank. You all know Kim, we know me. Um, David O'Connell has also been a member of the, um, of the committee as well. Mark Tominick, who used to work for the director for, for the uh, Department of Community Economic Dis Development and now is the Deputy Director of Community and, e and Economic Development for Northampton County is on the committee. Carlos Urena, one of our local business owners at Stoke Cole. Julie Van Osdell, who is the second um, for Kim at the East and Main Street Initiative former councilwoman um, Sandy Volcano and Sean Ziller um, round out that committee and we already talked about uh, our our support. Um, as it relates to the mission of, of this entire program, obviously we want to create a comprehensive actionable document and it has to have certain key focus. Sure, we want it to be community focused. We want it to be inclusive and equitable and flexible. But more than you're going to see in this is that it's very data oriented. And what we want to be able to do is tell the story of the city through actual data and real information that businesses can use in understanding the market that they can address here and, and really understand the opportunity that the city presents for their specific business. Um, what do we want to accomplish with this? Well, we want, we want the community and our, our, our business residents and those that we're going to be trying to recruit to better understand the business market. We want to strategically attract the right kind of private investment in the city, not redundant investment, but investment here that's going to be successfully you know, um, invested. We want to, we want to re-engage and activate underutilized properties and actually strategically locate the right businesses in the right part of the city so that they actually um, have the best chance at success. And we want to position the downtown and ultimately the remainder of the city because everything we're going to do in this um, document is going to be extrapolated to the other three districts of the city. We, we want to position them for, for business success and for business development success and ultimately to help put together a business retention program that will be uh, essentially a, uh, an, a, a component of, of what the work that we will be doing. 
So the model that Wisconsin created has, has eight steps. We've currently addressed you know, um, parts of about six of them. We're not working in absolute um, linear progression here. There are some things that are happening on each of these. So first, we did create the, the recruitment team. Um, we've created a supportive business environment, as I mentioned. We've been out on the street actually talking to the businesses, talking to residences. We've done several surveys to be able to understand their attitudes and their desires, their needs, the things they want to have in close proximity so we can understand the business makeup that will likely be utilized by our local residents. Um, we've also started to assemble recruitment and marketing materials in the form of data. This data will be used to be able to actually you know, reach out to businesses to let them know again what the market will allow for here for their, for their, um, for their investment. We want to identify the ideal tenant mix. We know that there are missing pieces in our business community. We know there are opportunities to create additional, you know, for instance, tourism businesses here in the city. We know there's lots of opportunity there. Um, we wanted to identify, you know, prospective tenants, reach out to those tenants um, and, and contact them. So those things are in, there are work on those first six. There, is, there are components that are complete. I'm going to let um, Sean, you know, kind of walk you through the work that we've done to date. And, and my, when you see the data platforms we're using and the kind of information that we've been able to generate, I think you're going to be impressed by the intelligence that's going on in, inside of this business recruitment strategy. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sean. Good evening, Council. Uh, so as John said, this is this, this, the purpose of this document is, is really to twofold for us. Um, it's to develop a robust business recruitment and marketing strategy in keeping with post-COVID-19 trends and, and demands. Um, so really, we feel that Easton's at the point now where we can be selective about the businesses we recruit. So how do we go about doing that? And secondly, formalize an existing informal business onboarding process. Oftentimes, when businesses are interested in coming to Easton, they're contacting Kim, who's then letting John and I know. They don't know what space they need or how they go about filling that vacancy. So really formalizing through codes and planning uh, and the finance process, what that looks like. So when establishing this, this committee, uh, we asked ourselves, what are the kind of broader questions we want to address? So for us, it's what's the city's business ecosystem, particularly within the downtown, going to look like in 5, 10, 15 years or beyond? How does the city evaluate and manage proper business planning and development? Presently, which businesses and, indus in, and industries in the city are suffering, whether that's financially or operationally? And strategically, thinking ahead, what will each of the city's neighborhoods require in order for their respective businesses to achieve sustainability and for those business owners and employees to be able to successfully live, work, and thrive in our community? As John pointed out, a big tenant of this committee is creating a document that is actionable that we don't create and it looks, looks nice and we can put it up on a shelf. But something that we can repeatedly go to in attracting businesses and, and really re allowing our businesses to refer to. So what are the data tools we're employing in this process? There's several. There's, the first is Placer AI, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. Um, that's contracted with the city. We've used that to really determine our, our event attendance at things like Winter Village. Um, but we're now using it on a, on a, on a much uh, uh, analytical uh, level with, with business recruitment. Um, there's data that was provided to us by the PA Downtown Center about kind of what are our opportunity gaps, um, what, are we, what, what industries um, do we, uh, you know, can, can we leverage here in the city. Uh, we also had a, a, a trial period with Safety View, which was a traffic data platform um, that was in collaboration with, with uh, General Motors Future Roads, and that can help us to analyze the traffic patterns within the downtown. And then obviously our codes and planning and finance department data, and then various developed surveys, which we'll see uh, shortly. So this is screen capture from that Placer platform that I had shown. Um, so really allows us to drill down to even individual corridors, individual businesses, um, to examine their visitation. Um, and, you know, generally, where are their visitors coming from? Um, and to be able to market as a result. So in this instance, I worked with Kim to kind of geofence um, our high traffic business corridors in the downtown. In this case, it's that 300 and 600 block of Northampton Street. Um, and we're really using that to analyze year to year, month to month, what are those trends look like. This is just another example I wanted to show. This is uh, the, uh, when I, we looked at Winter Village 2023, this shows you, it actually shows you the, pop, the percentage uh, of attendance uh, per zip code. So we're actually able to drill down and determine from the New Jersey market where is the client base and the visitation coming from and what does that look like. 
uh, just additional uh, kind of uh, screenshots from Placer. This talks about the retail, or I'm sorry, the resident uh, leakage in the downtown. So residents who live downtown, some of our council people, uh, when they're leaving the downtown, where are they going and why are they going there? Why are they leaving the neighborhood and what are they needing to access that maybe we can look about having here um, in the city? Just another screen to talk about our trade area. So uh, Placer allows us to make kind of incremental and forecast uh, uh, inferences. So you're looking at 2020, uh, 2019 data, 2022 uh, changes, and then they are able to forecast 2027. So what does the population in that 15 mile radius outside of the downtown look like? Um, and then kind of what will the, the progress or the projected progress look like in, in years to come? Safety view is another tool we utilized here. Um, in this case, we're looking at the downtown neighborhood in this snapshot. We're able to look at quarter to quarter, um, what it's, what's the kind of data and traffic flow. And also we worked with Public Works um, for some, in some of these instances to, as we introduced traffic calming efforts, um, what were some of the market changes we were able to, to determine through that. As it relates to business recruitment, this will re be really pivotal as we start to fill those vacancies and, and uh, analyze uh, those, those corridors. So some of the surveying we, we talked about, and I put QR codes up here for our uh, visitor survey and for our residents' business needs survey, if anybody in the audience wants to scan them. Um, so we created a couple surveys, and we're still in the process of creating more. One was our, our customer intercept survey, so our visitor survey. So when people are coming to businesses, we're hoping businesses will post this QR code. And it's just a very quick survey about your experience in the downtown, or if you're coming to Winter Village, your experience while in the downtown. Residence Business Needs Survey, um, where we've been working with finance to put that in utility, uh, the QR code in the utility bill, so residents of the City of Easton can also provide their feedback. Something I want to note, the Downtown Business Needs Survey, uh, this group here in the third row uh, went door to door at our businesses in the downtown. We mapped it out. We had teams go out, and they were able to collect 107 responses from those business owners. And then last, lastly, we're working on a property owner or a realtor survey to get a sense of what a real estate agents see um, or, or how they bring clients to Easton and what are they saying when they're, when they're trying to attract clients. So this is just briefly some of that survey results and analysis we gathered. Um, in this case, it was from the downtown business owner survey. Uh, the question was what type three, what top three data points relevant to the downtown would assist you in how you operate, market your business, or would be helpful to know? And then we were able to break that down based upon the category, whether it's retail, travel, healthcare, uh, and so on and so forth. And these are, these are data points that are accessible in Placer. So when we go out to businesses, for example, we met with uh, Amon's Indian, Indian Cuisine, a lot of the data they're collecting qualitatively, we're able to, to uh, uh, verify via Placer. And then another from the customer intercept survey, what other businesses would you frequent if they were available downtown? We kind of took all those responses and put it into a word cloud. Apparently we have a lot of Bozer Geist fans because that, that's yeah. prominently featured. Uh, but obviously one big thing you see here is grocery. Um, that's something we heard from business owners, something we heard from residents. So the question is, is a grocery chain going to want to locate in the downtown? We have the data that will help to determine that. They have their own data. So maybe we can approach, instead of a full chain grocery in the downtown, a hybrid model, um, something that would appeal to the residents who live here, uh, for the, the worker base that operates here day to day. Um, so really it's this data that'll help to inform us in attracting those types of businesses. As John pointed out, we also made the decision to reach out to uh, 16 communities across the Commonwealth that we felt, whether they were larger than us, smaller than us, had a, a fairly robust um, business, business base. Um, so obviously it's your usual suspects in Allentown and Bethlehem, um, but we also reached out to, to Newcastle um, out near Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Wilkes-Barre, Williamsport, York, um, so a lot of these, of, of those 16, we uh, have met with, nine of them. Um, all of them indicated that they did not have a formalized business recruitment strategy. Um, we also met with Discover Lehigh Valley and the LVEDC to talk about business recruitment from a regional perspective. What this points to, and I don't want to over, over promise and under deliver, but if we're able to create a document and a strategy that is actionable and robust, I really think this will be something that um, is, is an example across across the Commonwealth. And that's just a map of where some of those communities are. So finally, initial steps and in where we are now. 
as John touched on, we concurrently we're working on several of these steps, but really we, we have conducted the formation of the Business Recruitment Committee. Committee. We've done a degree of market analysis, so now we're on step three, four, uh, five, and six. When we initially designed this, it was intended to be a 12-month to, I think, 16-month process. We're finding out very quickly that it'll be an 18 to 24-month um, with, obviously, some continual follow-up in development of the strategy. We're in it for the long haul um, and, and hoping something uh, meaningful will come, come from it. So lastly, what, why are we here? Uh, where could we use, use your support as council and where we will likely need your support moving forward? So obviously helping and raising public awareness with the community um, of open surveys. These are things we're going to start publishing on our social media. Um, you know, it's gonna, for the residents, it's going to be in their tax bill, and it's important that they fill it out because we, we want their, their vision and their feedback. Your own thoughts and feedback as to business recruitment um, focuses and help in understanding market needs. You all represent different parts of the community, and we want your insight into that. Awareness to DCD of available properties and vacancies as they become live. Again, oftentimes it's Kim letting me know, hey, this property on North Hampton Street, they're leased, they're looking for a new tenant. Um, so I'll rely on your expertise to also filter that insight. Support once this initiative ultimately moves beyond the downtown, as John pointed to. This is going to start in the downtown, but then it's going to eventually go to our other neighborhoods, and we'll really rely on you um, to adapt that to, to those communities. And where we will likely need council support, implementation of proposed changes to infrastructure, pedestrian access and egress, things that will develop at the end of the strategy, implementation of proposed changes to policy and, and economic framework of the city, and then a consideration possibly of new incentive and business district considerations. So as we're starting to really understand the community, and where it's moving forward, um, we can plan accordingly. So really, we're at the early stages of, of this, the initial steps. We'll be back to you uh, in, in hopefully the not too distant future to talk about the progress we've made. John and I are open to uh, any questions, really, any of the committee. But uh, thank you for the time uh, tonight. Any questions from council? Thank you, Sean. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, you, Kim. Thank you. I want to. Um, Take this opportunity to introduce uh, and welcome to back to council chambers uh, former councilman David O'Connell, former councilwoman Pam Panto, and I did see Pastor Davis here. He had to leave. Oh, he had to leave. Okay, Pastor Davis is the pastor at Shiloh uh, Baptist Church, Greater Shiloh, and they are very active in our care for the homeless. And uh, they did the showers that we went to and we saw them. The showers that the homeless would have, the shower facility. Uh, and also, um, they're the developer of Shiloh Commons, which is about 50 to 60 uh, affordable rental units that will be built on Canal Street. So I just wanted to say hi to him. All right, as we move forward, before we get to John, would you give us an update, the elevator speech on uh, blue, blueprint communities, since um, uh, we want to talk about this, and it's on the agenda tonight yeah, for, sure. for me to uh, be representative. So um, among the things you'll consider tonight um, is a resolution um, in support of um, our application for, um, for the Blueprint Communities Program. Um, we were very lucky to have the South Side um, accepted into the program. This is a relatively prestigious you know, um, uh, acknowledgement. It is a 10-year designation that will stay with the South Side. And um, it is a r really interesting um, subset of the Federal Home Loan Bank and the Pennsylvania Downtown Center working together to help um, communities revitalize and to help them plan for revitalization. And one of the things that you know came out of a uh, conversation that we had with the Southside Civic um, Association, oh, probably a year ago at this point, maybe even longer. Um, was that you know we need to kind of reinvent the business district um, in the south side and you know this kind of struck a chord with us in the department it kind of led us to think you know what let's start thinking about how we can put together some planning resources to accomplish this task and that's exactly what blueprint is going to do for us they're going to bring together um, professionals inside of pennsylvania downtown center and the federal home loan bank to help guide us through a strategic planning process um, a comprehensive planning process if you will for the south side and this not only um, brings uh, planning talent um, 
to help us you know, consider the possibilities of the South Side. It also brings with it um, access to a myriad of different state and federal resources that can be utilized to help undertake the projects that are actually identified in the plan that we'll develop. So this is a really um, great uh, example of, um, of, of community work, and I want to thank the Southside Civic Association for, um, for taking the lead and giving us you know, um, the pieces to begin this process. I think we also have some members here of the planned cohort for um, the Blueprint Communities, which are, are the group that you'll see here. So, um, and from Fidelity Bank, Mark Jobes will be on the cohort. Uh, Mayor Panto will be a member. Pastor Davis, myself, Mike Brett, our Deputy Director of the Redevelopment Authority will be on the cohort. Craig Updegrove from the Easton Housing Authority. Um, Amy Allison from um, the Easton Area Neighborhood Center. Jared Mass from the GDP. And uh, Michelle Lockhart from Southside Civic Association will round out that cohort. We have one that is to be determined that was actually supposed to be um, a position that Steve Narosky, our former director of planning and codes, was going to have when he left the organization. We have a vacancy, so we are looking to replace one individual in that cohort. Um, and this group will be the ones that work with the folks from the Pennsylvania Downs Town Center and from the Federal Home Loan Bank to begin putting together the plan I spoke of earlier. So that's pretty much a quick overview of Blueprint Communities, but this is, a, this is a, a neat designation to have when we're making applications to the state for certain types of um, resources and for that matter to um, federal programming for certain types of funding resources. Having that designation associated with the South Side will give it a, um, a significant you know, um, bump in terms of its eligibility and priority for those programs. If there are any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Michelle Lockhart's here. Okay. Um, we want to introduce Valley Health Partners, speaking of Southside. <laughs> <laughs> I use that as a segue, the blueprint yeah, communities. That's exactly what I was thinking, perfect segue. Uh, can, I can I jump in yeah, real quick? Um, Mayor <clears throat> and uh, Council, uh, uh, I did want to uh, preface the uh, presentation by uh, Veronica Gonzalez, who's the CEO of Valley Health Partners. But as part of um, Dr. Ruggles, the safety committee, um, and looking at all the resources that are available in the city of Easton, um, we took the opportunity for Veronica to come here to talk about her current project. But this is just building upon what we've been talking about um, in our committee. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Veronica. Great. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to introduce Valley Health Partners Community Health Center and also talk about our plans to bring primary care and preventative health care services to the south side of Easton in early 2025. So still a few months away, but our approach to community well-being is very much in partnership with the communities we serve. We really tailor it based on the needs of those communities. Um, so really taking the next few months to meet with community-based organizations, community leaders, and members to understand how do we meaningfully, meaningfully enter the space of Easton. So thank you for having us and allowing us to kick off this journey. So we are a federally qualified health center lookalike. If you're not familiar with the FQHC model, also known as a community health center, we're part of a national movement designed to bring primary care and preventative services to medically underserved areas that don't necessarily have access to health care. Uh, so we provide whole person care and render services to everyone regardless of their ability to pay. Uh, so at Valley Health Partners, we offer primary care for all ages of the community. We have integrated behavioral health services, really prioritizing both physical and mental needs. Uh, we have women's health, obstetrics and gynecology, dental, vision, chiropractic medicine. And we have a longstanding street medicine program that has serviced the Eastern community for quite some time, taking care of our unsheltered neighbors, providing primary care where they're most comfortable to receive it. So we are not completely new to, to the Eastern community. Uh, we have a veteran health program that has very specialized uh, members that can provide care coordination for our nation's veterans and really comprehensive wraparound services that I'll talk a little bit more about today. We are the 10th largest community health center in the state out of 51 health centers. And we currently have over 100 community-based partnerships. So again, when I talk about our approach to community well-being, is really in partnership. Some are already in Easton because of our street medicine program, but really looking to increase that number as, as we enter the space. So a little bit about our history. Uh, we opened our doors July 1st of 2020, although many of our practices have been providing community-based care for over three decades. 
Um, so many were previously under the umbrella of Lehigh Valley Health Network. Our roots do come from LVHN. You can see the practices there in the green that were previously under LVHN are now under Valley Health Partners, primarily in the city of Allentown, where we take care of over 33,000 members of the community. We do have about 500 uh, members from Easton that travel to receive health care with us in Allentown. Um, since our inception, we've expanded an additional school-based health center, chiropractic medicine. We also expanded to downtown Allentown, the previous morning called administration building. We had a primary care, dental, vision, and behavioral health in that space. And now coming soon to the south side of Easton, where we will bring primary care, behavioral health, dental, vision, and a pharmacy to that space. And so this is a little bit about our partnership with Lehigh Valley Health Network. So it's really designed to be a model where two healthcare organizations come together to bring services to vulnerable community members through the entire healthcare ecosystem. So Valley Health Partners really focusing on primary care, prevention, providing care that's culturally sensitive, linguistically appropriate, meeting patients where they are, and going beyond the traditional four walls of medicine. If our patients need to be admitted for higher acute care needs, see a specialist, rehab services, home health care, that's where our partners at LVHN come in. So our approach to care, one of the things I'm most proud of, is very much coordinated. Um, so we have a multidisciplinary group of colleagues, such as social workers, medical interpreters, care managers, who really address the social factors of health. So when you think about health outcomes, only 20% is influenced by health care, by us, the health care professionals. 80% is really the places we live, the food we eat, our environment, and those are the social drivers of health, right? So that's why it's important for us to come to Easton and partner with the experts of housing, of transportation, of food, uh, because that's not our expertise. And together, we can eliminate barriers to care and help our community achieve their health and wellness goals. We also have financial counselors. They'll help patients access medical assistance. If they're not eligible, they're penny certified. They can enter the market, find affordable health care insurance. If they're under the 200% of the federal poverty guidelines, we have a sliding fee scale where patients can receive care at a low nominal fee as low as $5. All right, so let's talk about Easton in the south side. So we are going to be part of the mill at Easton. Uh, you may be familiar with the Dollar General supermarkets there in that space, and we are going to be there in, in the back on West Lincoln Street, um, a 13,000 square foot space there. And I'm going to give you a visual here of still a draft, but we're in the final stages, so this is kind of a good visual of how we'll utilize the space. Um, so you can see there in the light red is the pharmacy. It is a community pharmacy, so it's available to all members of the community, regardless if you receive care with us or not. If it's accessible to you for your prescriptions, it can be used. The orange space is more for primary care, behavioral health. We'll have a chiropractor there as well. Uh, the blue space will be vision for optometry and an optical center. And the aqua green there will be dental. So we'll have dentists and hygienists. Again, everything designed to be a one-stop shop for primary care preventative services for all members of the family. So we will take care of all ages. Um, and we'll have financial counselors there, social workers, interpreters, again, providing those wraparound services. So I'm going to do two quick practice highlights. When we decided to expand into the Easton community, we realized we have practices that have provided community-based health care for over three decades. Um, they're experts on doing it. We're recognized in the top 11 to 20 percent of health outcomes across the country. Um, so we know how to do this well and produce high quality um, outcomes. So Family Health Center is one of the practices that's uh, serviced the Allentown community for over three decades. So will be extending to the south side. Uh, we actually have clinicians who live in Easton. We have staff who live in Easton who are excited to come and practice and service their community. So they have a team-based approach to care and really can take care of all that are doing well and also have chronic conditions. And our children's clinic also has been around for three decades. They take care of about eight to 10,000 kids every year have subclinics based on the needs of the kids they care for. So they have ADHD clinics, obesity clinics, nutrition clinics, um, adolescent medicine. And so again, we'll bring those services based on the needs here in Southside. And then lastly, we'd love to employ folks from the Easton community as we open up our doors in the next few months. So as we have mission-driven colleagues, uh, we'd love to see them apply to work with us. So the question I asked Mayor Panso and the team, you know, how can we best service Easton together is, is ultimately, you know, what we'd love to hear and appreciate so far we've been connected to some great community-based partners and look forward to making those connections in the next few months. Can, can we go back to the slides? Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, Veronica. Veronica. Yeah. Or one, go up one more about the jobs. I want to do uh, Oh, the jobs? I ran past that one. It's back, I think it's like the second to the end. That's the jobs right there. Oh, where, where? The employment? Right here. Oh, there, oh, there, there. 
thank you very much. Of course. Thank you for having me. I just wanted the public to know that, you know, these are the things that work. The staff works on very hard. I want to thank John and Lewis for working on this and putting this together. Uh, but I also have to commend uh, <laughs> Tim Harrison, who is the developer. At, uh, we, we always tend to give developers a bad name. He really wanted to make this happen, and he did. And um, we're very, very happy. Both of his goals, a grocery store and a health facility. <laughs> and we're really happy to have Valley Health Partners. We've been really impressed with the already. They aren't even open yet, and already they're helping the community. So we're very happy. Thank you. No, and, and thank you guys. You know, before we made the decision, we went to Cheston Elementary. We've yep. met with leaders of the city of Easton, and we thought, heck yeah, we're going to Easton. I mean, <laughs> really impressed. So kudos to you guys. <laughs> thank you. So Any much. other comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Melody Rogers, president of Southside Civic. Okay, um, being president of Southside Civic Association, we had a need to want to put more back into Southside. It got to be like a ghost town over there. Our businesses were leaving. Uh, no um, physical uh, place for health care and different things. Uh, food is at a store is not making one, people want to go to these stores. They want to go out to other places and they're not able to travel to these places. But to have John and Sean work with us and hear our plea was the best thing that ever happened to us. And we thank them a million times. And to have Valley Health Centers come to us, it is like beyond happy for this community. We need this in our community. And they are there to build us up and we want to thank them from the bottom of our heart to hear our plea. And we appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we have um, public comment on agenda items only. If there's anyone from the public that we to talk about agenda items, you come up, give your name and address. One moment, please. Sherry LaDuca, 270 West Ascahano okay. Street. All right, one moment. Jerry LaDuca, 270 West Escahani Street. I'm here on the Davis Street issue. I've been here before on the Davis Street issue. Um, I actually bought pictures tonight, if I can present some pictures. Sure. If that's okay. parking street the parking issue and the buses and the overcrowded and how they park the pictures show how they park up to the corners and it's hard to turn um, there's a picture of the accident last year from somebody trying to go too fast to get by these cars before somebody was coming the other way and somebody pulled out and this has happened twice already in that on that street um, same issue I'm Melissa pound 200 next 200 block Nescahone Street same issue, just turning onto the street, there's there's um, cars parked and you can't go around them. I almost got hit three times in one day. And I'm teaching my youngest son how to drive and it's just not um, safe for him to go that road at all. So just the same issue with the um, cars parked on the street. Thank you. We discussed this at the staff meeting again on um, Tuesday and uh, we've come up with a, a strategy. Um, Mr. Pitterbone, why don't you address the strategy? Davis Street. He's like, what? Um, <laughs> it, well, it's on the, it's on the agenda tonight. Yeah, tonight yeah. Um, it's what they're talking about. We yeah. um, discussed it last month, the eliminating the parking on Davis. But we're also going to paint the uh, curbs That'd be a, yeah. 30 feet. And then we, we also found out that a lot of people that are parking there don't even live there. Yeah. They're coming to visit people and they're parking there. We've noticed. Like, we just left the house and there was Jersey Place parked there. Jersey Place parked there. They don't even live there. And they're still, there's parking there. And they park, you can't get out. So... And there's also parking in front of the fire hydrants, which is also a no-no. But <laughs> chief, chief is aware of it, and uh, okay. traffic is aware of it, and they're they're going to do, and we're going to, and public service is going to get it painted, the curbs, so we have uh, the cur corners are kept clean, and and you have a better sight line. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we also address the. Yeah, I'm on the same issue as well. Okay. Hannah Staples, 417 West Madison Street. So again, the parking issue uh, with how much there is there. I started with one car and then it just you know, followed suit from there. 
But um, my issue is not just the safety of driving through there, but there are school buses that are dropping off our children there as well. And these school buses take up half the block. So when a car comes through, the bus can't back up. The car has very little room to move. And there's children moving back and forth. So that's also a safety issue for our kids. Um, the other issue that I saw here, though, um, that I just wanted to bring up, it says that you are looking to do this from starting at Nesquahawning Street to Berwick Street. The issue really, I mean, it, yes, it does start there, but if you're going to limit the parking in general, it should be from West St. Joseph Street all the way to Berwick Street. Because when they see that, oh, well, we can park in this little tiny block here, there's a corner right there on West St. Joseph Street where there's a house right there in the stop sign, and you can barely see around that. So if there's a car parked there, we're going to have a problem turning that corner. So it really should be the entire block from that corner to the, you know, to Berwick Street. It is blocked off, uh, no parking. Once you go through Berwick Street, leading up to Philadelphia Road, a small section, because of how narrow it is there. So they did take that into accountability many years ago. I've lived in the same residence for 41 years and never saw this until last year and a half or so. Um, when the snow comes, I'm sure that our plows are not thrilled to be having to deal with, you know, cars being parked there. It's it's very scary for us to drive through. So. Hopefully you guys can take into consideration what our residents are dealing with over there and we can move positively through this. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else want to address city council on agenda items? Artie? Uh, slow down there. You're going too fast. <laughs> Sorry, I ran over. Scoot. Artie Rabbits, 144 Church Street. I just want to say to the council and to the committee, Fabulous! I heard more done today to that you've done in the past day than I've heard in a lot of meetings. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Artie. Um, moving right along, we'll go on to uh, consent agenda. Madam Clerk. Yes. Um, a resolution approving the City of Easton and Mayor Panto's participation in the Blueprint Communities Community Team. We have a resolution approving a certificate of appropriateness for 200 Northampton Street a resolution approving a certificate for 431 Northampton Street, a resolution approving a certificate for 106 to 108 South. <laughs> Excuse me one moment. Your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> uh, let's see. 106 to 108 South 3rd Street, a resolution approving a certificate for 233 to 35 Ferry Street. Certificate, a uh, resolution approving a certificate for 36 to 38 Ferry Street. A resolution approving a certificate of appropriateness for 185 South 3rd Street. Resolution approving a third handicap space on the 600 block of Pardee Street. Um, a resolution approving an agreement with responsible recycling services for an electronic waste recycling event and a resolution approving an agreement with Hartford Construction. Is there a motion to motion. approve? Motion by Councilman Pinnebone. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Councilman Rose. Roll call. Mayor Panto. Aye. Mr. Pinnebone. Aye. Mrs. Rose. Aye. Dr. Ruggles. Aye. Mrs. Sultana. Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. And Mr. Ettinger? Aye. There are no reports to be received by council, and there's uh, no correspondence, so we'll move on to Finance uh, Committee, Mr. Brown, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have anything on the financial uh, portion of it, but last night the committee did meet, and we talked about uh, decorum and Council Chambers. Uh, myself and Mr. Pennebone brought some ideas to uh, the committee, and we're going to be looking into uh, what is best needed for how to run the council meeting in a, in a very smooth way. That's all I have. Thank you, Vice Mayor uh, Brown. Economic Development Committee, Mr. Pinnebaum, Councilman Pinnebaum. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight I don't have a report. However, about two weeks ago, I think, I received a Facebook message from uh, a young lady, Ms. Tamfia, right here in front of me, um, who informed me that her 16-year-old son is really interested in helping the city uh, become a blue zone, become the uh, city of Easton. So we had a meeting. I think we were here for about three hours. 
Um, Mayor joined us towards the end. And it was very, very good to hear this young man's ideas and what he wants to do to help uh, clean up and better our city. So we asked him to come and present tonight, and he's going to uh, take the podium and present his thoughts and ideas uh, of turning Easton into a blue zone. Hello again, Mason. <clears throat> good evening. My name is Mason Wally, and I am a junior at Maven Academy. I want to thank Mayor, Pan uh, Mayor Panto and Councilman Pinsabone for giving me the opportunity to speak about my project at this meeting. I asked my meeting with them regarding my passion project for improving our community in Easton. I want you all to imagine a place where people of all ages can come together as a community and an environment that provides a system that incorporates a social, active, and health-based lifestyle that leads to a longer and healthier life. How many of you would love to live to be 100 years old? These places exist across the world labeled as blue zones. Blue zones create a system that allows for people's lifespans to reach around 100 years old. Some of these places include Sar Sardinia, Italy, Icaria, Greece, Nicoya Peninsula, Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California, and Okinawa, Japan. And hopefully soon, Eason will be on that list. So what is a blue zone, and why are they so successful? Blue zones are regions within the world that promote a healthy lifestyle, community-based environment that has led the citizens living a longer than average lifespan, leading to a larger number of centenarians. Why are citizens of blue zones living such a long and healthy, healthy lives? Here are a list of common denominators. <clears throat> Active lifestyle. Having an environment that constantly pushes citizens into moving without thinking, thinking about it. For example, increasing areas for pedestrians and cyclists. Positive and growth mindset. In these blue zones, certain philosophies are prominent when it comes to living your best life. For example, in Okinawa, Japan, they follow the mindset of ikigai. Iki means to live, and gai means reason. Stress management. Reducing stress drastically helps improve life quality. Today, stress impacts almost everyone's lives. To combat this, Blue Zone citizens do things like taking a nap or praying. For us, this can be anything from just laughing to stretching or even interacting with people, as long as it helps reduce stress and helps you relax. Diet. The 80% rule. In blue zones, not overeating is crucial when it comes to, uh, when it comes to a long and healthy life. The, the Okinawans use this method by eating until they're 80% full. Plant slam. Eating a certain amount of food may help, but without eating the right foods, it will never be as helpful. Eating foods like beans, lentils, and soy are all foods that help you maintain a balanced diet. And by providing incentives to local restaurants and cafes, we can help push healthier options for our community. Connect. Belonging. Being part of a like-minded community. 97% of centenarians belong to a like-minded community. Having a community with people sharing the same values or ideas as you is shown to help improve your lifespan up to seven years. Love ones first. Valuing family is something all successful centenarians did. Having people you care about and love is crucial for a long and happy life. Right people, right tribe. Having a social group that helps support and push healthy behaviors onto you can help inf impact and influence you. Now, using these philosophies what are com that are common throughout Blue Zones, how can we improve Easton with it? Well, we don't need to make universal changes to create a blue zone environment. We can take incremental steps that will build and create a healthy and active community. These are some of the ideas that we can implement for Easton. Public community areas, planting trees in open areas that help promote pedestrian activity. Having a garden where all the food that's grown can be donated to the local soup kitchen or given away to people who need it. 
SCYC, Senior Citizen and Youth Club. These clubs will encourage and promote people of all ages to come together and enjoy the things they love. Some examples of this are our book club and cooking club, together through healthy and active hobbies. Easton and the citizens. So hold on. Why am I doing this? And why did I start this? Well, Easton and the citizens have welcomed me and my family with open arms when we, when we moved here two years ago. Now, I want to return the hospitality and make Eason an even better place to live for its citizens, and I am passionate about making an impact and improving the quality of life for generations to come. I want to thank you all for your time and opportunity to allow me to present my passion project towards improving our community. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mason. Thank you. Uh, Mason, before you sit down, after we met, I reached out to Tony Claypez. He's the guy with the big mustache right waving. He's with the um, Eastern Environmental Advisory Committee. So he wants to talk to you as well, and I think we could put you to work. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything else, Ms. Pinnell? That's all I have, Mayor. Planning and Coach Committee, Councilmember Rose. Thanks, Mayor. It's hard to follow that up. Good yeah. job, Mason. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yesterday, I attended the Affordable Housing Summit that was presented by the Community Action League of the Lehigh Valley at um, Ben Franklin Technology Partners in Bethlehem. Um, it was a really great meeting. Um, a lot of great data was presented, and I feel it'll be helpful towards our efforts locally and also regionally in the Lehigh Valley. So I will be sharing the event recording and presentation with the rest of Council, um, and as well as future summer uh, summit dates coming up in 2024. Um, I've had a lot of people reach out about the Confluence Development Plan. Um, your chance is coming up, so I invite everyone to attend the Planning Commission meeting next week, Wednesday, April 3rd at 6.30 in this room. Um, the agenda includes the Confluence Updated Development Plan, um, and it also um, on the agenda is a land development for multifamily use located at 1002 West Berwick Street. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Public Safety Committee, Councilmember Ruggles. Uh, thank you. Uh, we were going to have a public safety meeting prior to this one, this meeting, but you got interrupted by executive council, so uh, uh, we we did not meet. So hopefully uh, next meeting I'll have a report from our public safety committee. Public Works Committee, Mr. Councilman Edgar. I have no report tonight. Mayor. Administration Committee, Councilmember Sultana. I do not have a report, Mayor. Uh, report of the Mayor. <coughs> I have a report. Uh, I did, I, I was very honored uh, this last week. I represented uh, Governor Shapiro and DCD Secretary uh, Seiger in Taiwan uh, at the Smart Cities and Net Zero Conference. I was very impressed that a small country like Taiwan could be doing so much environmentally to reduce their uh, green gas uh, emissions. Um, it was a really, the over 2,000 exhibitors, uh, which shows you how, how much Taiwan is doing. I saw everything from electric buses to um, uh, water plant uh, upgrades. So I was very impressed and very happy to do that. Um, did not like being there. I was only there for two days. I spent more time in airplane than I did on the ground, but that's okay. Today I, I went to the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission's uh, PennDOT, released their study on passenger rail. Uh, nothing new that we didn't know before. It's going to be very, very expensive, both in capital needs and in the hundreds of millions of dollars, plus the um, uh, operating losses every year. So um, I probably won't see it in my lifetime, but we're going to keep working towards passenger rail. Um, Nesquahoning Memorial Park. Um, over here we have one of the placards that will be uh, given uh, to nine members over there who were part of the. Um, what's in it? Yeah, what, what, what are they? The Buffalo Soldiers. Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. yeah. Buffalo Soldiers. So um, the, the, we have nine of them coming, but. Uh, I don't know that that project will be done until the earliest will be done will be the fall, but they are planning something in July, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to meet that deadline, but uh, we are working on it. Uh, we have uh, two designs. The committee picked one, um, and we'll 
start to price that out and try to get um, uh, estimates on it. Um, there's been a lot of uh, social media comments about streetlights. Let me just explain how streetlights work. Streetlights, we pay, the city pays, regardless of whether it's on or not, $18 a month. That's our tariff. They're not metered. So there's a tariff that the state sets, and it's $18 a month. So we want you to report uh, streetlights that are out. Streetlights will sit, will reduce crime when they're lit. But when they're not lit, we, we don't have any 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 choice but to, to wait for you to call us or to call Med Ed. On their website, uh, David, do you want to tell them how to get a hold of the Streetlight Committee? It would go right on their website, right? To go right on their website, and there's a... There's a place to report streetlights that are out. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can call our office, but I need the poll number. So you can call the uh, street, you can call the mayor's office, 610-250-6610. We just need that poll number, and we'll report it. It's a MedEd poll number. Yeah, it's a MedEd poll oh, number. Please go so uh, we, we, do, we, we don't want, we don't, we want to pay. About three years ago, maybe four years ago, I got a $5,000 credit on our electric bill because of so many lights being out. They used to be able, to, when you reported it, it was, was re repaired within 24 hours. It's not the case anymore. They've cut back on their employment as well. Um, I also met this week, we heard Mason's report, uh, a young boy by the name of um, Finley Campbell uh, did a book called Home is Where the Heart Is, and uh, it's a really good book. It's a lot of the things that people probably don't know about Easton, uh, like with the East Everybody says, "What's that flag doing up there, Mayor? Is that is that what is that? Is that the state flag? No, it's the Easton flag." They don't know the history of the Easton flag. He talks about the history of the Easton flag. He talks about the monument, the bugler, and things like that. But um, Finley was in the office this week and, and really good. I also, want to announce that the uh, pools will be on a rotating um, daily again. Um, they'll they'll be opening on even days at Eddie's side, and odd days at Heil. Um, it'll get people. Um, used to some people really enjoy that because they've never been to Eddie Sider, they've never been to Ohio, now they'll be there. But uh, we're still having troubles getting uh, lifeguards. So if you know anybody who wants to be a lifeguard and they have their senior life saving or we'll even train them, uh, the East and Wide hires all of our lifeguards. I also want to announce that the mayor's summer youth camp is back in force again and it'll be the week of July twenty second to the twenty sixth. So if you know anybody that's in high school preferably but or in junior high school that would like to be part of the mayor's summer youth camp um, where they'll make a presentation to city council on Wednesday night about what they would do if they were a council member, or uh, and spend a, the week with me uh, visiting various, the police department, the fire department, uh, the water plant, the wastewater plant, and uh, we'll show them how the inner workings of the city work. And uh, it, so far, I don't know, it's not me, it's just they, they enjoy it. And they, oh, they go out to lunch. We, we take them to lunch every day. I get sponsors, we go to lunch every day. Uh, they pick their restaurants, so they really like that. That's the end of my report. Mr. Campos? Um, Mayor, just quickly, uh, just to inform council, uh, I was at a um, at a, a training with uh, PELRAS, and that's a labor relations law up, uh, training and updates. Um, that, and I also, uh, who also brought with me um, Estelle Garingar, our HR manager. And typically, I bring also um, other directors, et cetera. Uh, next year, we'll be bringing uh, more individuals. And then the, I will provide a, an update to the agenda and any any supportive material, if you wish, um, to the uh, to the clerk, um, so you can read that. Um, and I'll send it to council as well. And then also I gave an update in the executive session, but I'll, I'll I'll let Joel provide that formal report. Thank you, Mr. Shear, report of the solicitor. <laughs> yes, uh, the. We met in exec executive session immediately prior to this meeting, and we actually covered all the areas that you cover in executive session, uh, potential litigation, uh, real estate, and employment matters. Thank you. Thank you. Correspondence, there's none to be received. Uh, unfinished business, there's none. We'll go right into new business, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. So we have bill number seven, amending language to chapter... 515-39. So moved. Second. So introduced. Introduced. So introduced. Mayor Panto. Do you want to 
Ninja Turtles. No, it's just oh, Ninja Turtles. Oh, that's right. We're in bill number eight. Okay. Um, bill number eight, amending chapter 560. No parking on Davis Street between Neskahoning and Berwick Streets. So introduced. Uh, hold on. I'll make, an, I'll make an amendment to that. That we start that at St. Joseph Street to um, Berwick Street. Instead of Neskahoning, we go to one further block further. That's my motion. Is oh, there, second. Uh, second to the amendment. <laughs> Mr. Pinnabone, Councilman Pinnabone. Um, on the amendment, uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Rose? Aye. Dr. Ruggles? Aye. Mrs. Sultana? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Ettinger? Aye. Mayor Panto? Aye. Mr. Pinnabone? Aye. Now on the amended ordinance. Just introduced, so we'll just change. So, Bill Number Nine. Yes. Bill Number Nine, amending sections of Chapter Four Thirty Five, B One and Two. So moved. It's moved. Introduced. Introduced. Bill Number Ten. I've done it this mayor. Introduced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill Number Ten, amending sections in Chapter Four Five Six of the Rental Property. So introduced. Bill number 11, amending sections in chapter 285-56, pool fees. So introduced. And a resolution amending the age requirement for fire department recruits. So introduced. Moved. Moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Just want to let you know that the um, Allentown Fire Academy accepts people that are 18 years of age. Our ordinance required them to be 21. So we're lowering it from 21 to 18. So if you know anybody wants to take the fire test that's going to be 18 years old, um, fire test will be given probably the, within the next year. Mary Brown. Roll call. Mayor, are we voting on this? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay, because I do have, since all the bills are together, but there are two bills that I will not be voting on now. Well, there, there were, the bills were only introduced. This is a resolution. We're done with the bills. Me? We're done with the right. bills. We're only voting on one. Is again agreement? They will be back on the table at next council meeting for a full vote. Uh, the bills that you're talking about, we're now doing a resolution. Right. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure the resolution services agreement RRS and the other resolutions, right? That's the only resolution out there. The only resolution for a vote is the fire department recruit age change okay I got it thank you so much Roll call. Sure. mr. Pinnabone aye mrs. Rose aye dr. Ruggles aye mrs. Sultana aye mr. Brown aye mr. Ettinger aye mayor Panto aye we're now at the end of the meeting uh, where public comments on any related items to city businesses or city issues rather uh, if you come up give your name and address Again, uh, Hannah Staples, 417 West Madison Street. I did hear you mention about the pools being open every other day again, which is fine. Um, but I have mentioned this before, I believe, with the mayor as well. Uh, there's a pool behind High, our park behind Heil Pool that is locked more than it's open. Um, it's a very nice pool, uh, or park, I'm sorry, very nice park that our children are not able to access unless the pool is open. The park is completely gated off in the pool. There's no access into the pool, no way the kids can get into it. They'd have to high, go up over a big hill and climb way over a fence to get in. We have uh, soccer leagues that play at that park right next to, and we have people coming from all over, and we have locked parks. So it doesn't look nice for us to have people coming from far and a park being locked. Also, if it's only gonna be open every other day, that's not giving the utilization for the money that went into that park for the children to be using it. Um, I'm there a lot for soccer with my older son, and it's sad that I have to leave the field to go somewhere else to take my toddler. So I just wanted to bring that up and bring it to the attention. Um, I don't know why they're locking it. I, I, I rented it this before. fall for a party. I was told that it was only used for rentals, but right. that, that can't be the case. I mean, we're not paying taxes for parks that are just for rentals. 
Wait, well, it is it is a park for rentals that we use for parties and different things. And you know, Southside we have a lot of good parks, right? We have the Neighborhood Center, we have Milton Park, we have Pioneer. Black uh, Lackanor, Lackanor just got redone. Understood, soccer, but they're redone. not next to our soccer field that are bringing people from all over from, you know, because we have an Eastern Soccer League. So that's just one example I have for you. But right. we have people coming from Makanji and Nazareth and everywhere. And then what they see is Easton not being welcoming with our park right there. They have kids that they have to entertain during the soccer games that are multiple games. Right. And they ha there's a park that's locked. I think when, when we spoke about it before, Mayor, it was a matter of it's the park that we rent for events and budgetary purposes it's just another park that we'd have to clean up from people from McCungy and Bethlehem and Allentown and everywhere else where you know we have about five good parks on Southside um, for our residents uh, and adding another park that we have to spend money and maintenance on to accommodate McCungy and Allentown and Bethlehem it just didn't make sense at the time um, but does, does that mean that our, our taxes are paying for that park that we're not able to utilize unless we rent it? That park is, is being utilized for rentals. Um, there's another five or six in Southside mm -hmm. that are open at all times. But it just just so I understand this, I understand that I've rented the park before. I've also rented other parks in our, in our area, you know, as well. So I know there's a rental fee. You pay for that fee to do cleanups and other things as that. Um, but my my curiosity on this is, are our are parts of our taxes go, you know that are par included for parks and things? Is that park included in that, or is that not part of that? Is but that only me, being taken care of by rentals? Would you give us an opportunity to look into that? Yes, and thank see you. if we can get back. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I mean we're going to look into it. I, I don't like any park that's locked. Exactly. Right. Thank okay. you. So um, it's a nice park. It's, I, it's yeah, a very no, nice park. The Hicksons. We had a problem with the Hicksons. Truancy no, there and vagrancy. The they're about staying there overnight. High that was the reason. Parts. Oh, I. I There's no lights it. there, but oh. we'll, we'll take a look at it. Thank you. It's just we go there a lot, and, yeah, and it'd no. just be wonderful to be able to use it more often than every other day in the summer. Thank no, you very much. No, no problem, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Melody Rogers, 710 Westbury Street, Easton. Uh, for regarding that park, the reason why it really actually stays locked because we've had a lot of kids hanging near where because it's dark, very dark back there, and they were destroying it. So that's why they kept it locked. I mean, we had asked many times to have it open too, but then we realized that it's just getting destroyed. The kids are hanging down there, and next thing you know, because it's so dark, they're back there doing drugs. Maybe we need to put a time on that, like some other park, like Hacker Park. It's or, open, yeah. open field, but it closes at a certain time. Just like dusk or something dusk. like that. But it's also so dark back there. I don't know if they yeah. need more lights or whatever, but that was the main problem because we had also had asked about that many times because it is a very nice park. And it's great for the kids, for the little kids, because of the little activities there. And it's just really nice to go sit back there after you've done it with the pool, go eat or something at the pavilion would be nice. But the problem was, like just like all the parks right now, it's getting the, a large sum of kids there at Centennial is another thing. There's like 50 kids in that park at nighttime. And the, I had called the chief and told him <coughs> we need to get the officer there and park over there and be around there and get those kids out of there because it's getting ridiculous. And they, we have to weed them out, he said, which is true. But 50 kids at one time at that park is not is not good to do. The neighbors are always complaining about it. So in summer, didn't even start yet. They're just hanging there because they're getting the feel of it because the weather is nice. So now these are not just little kids. These are the big high school kids that are just hanging there and destroying it. They have garbage all over the place. I went down several times to see it, and it was destroyed. Garbage cans all over. So. I mean, not Centennial. I'm sorry, Pioneer. I'm sorry, Pioneer. But Centennial, I'm sorry. Centennial was doing the same thing, too. They had kids over there, too, as well, hanging there at nighttime. But the officers weren't coming over there and seeing them. They are there at nighttime. My sister lives across the street. She'd be always calling me on the phone and say, call the officer. Tell them to come over. These kids are here. It's 11 o'clock at night, and they're over there because she doesn't feel safe with these kids. And it's not just a few kids. It's a gang of kids. But they see the officer drive by. They leave. They come back because he doesn't come back for a long time. And that's over at Centennial, too. Yeah, yeah. And she's, her husband died, so now she's there by herself. So, you know, see, and she sees out her window all the time. She can see directly at that park, and she sees how many kids are there at nighttime when it's really dark. They don't want to leave. But also at the Pioneer, having all these kids destroy that place, it was so bad over there with the garbage. And I feel got really bad for the city of Easton people that have to come over and clean up that garbage. There's no sense that they have to do that. But the 50 kids at one time at that park... I love to see them during the day. I love to see them activity over there. I don't want to say lock that gate up or anything, but they do not need to destroy it. 
They do not need to destroy it. So we just are going to, the neighbors are still contacting me. We're just going to keep an eye on it. We're just going to make it horrible for them that they don't want to stay there after a certain time at night. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pat? My name is Pat Gibson. I live at 368 Westberg Street. I'm going back to Heil. It's okay to have that open, but you almost have to have somebody there at all times because on the off days that the pool's closed, people that are coming in from out of town for the soccer and stuff, you're going to have everybody leaping over that fence into the pool on a hot day. Somebody's going to drown. Somebody's going to get hurt because it, it has been done in the past. When that gate wasn't locked at night, they called the dip and dance on their own and for cleanup. Are the people going to clean up? You almost have to have somebody there at all times watching that when it's open and not locked. I've been in Easton, grew up in here Easton all my life. I have nothing against it, but for the safety, you'll have a lot of lawsuits from a lot of out-of-town people because your kids are climbing up over the fence. And if it's hot, it's going to happen. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Anyone else like to address City Council on uh, any item? Uh, we, I see a lot of high school students here. You want to come up and just tell us who your who your high school teacher is? Somebody represent us. There you go. Um, I'm from Brian Valcones, and then most of these people are from Schumer's class. Oh, okay, great. Very nice. Okay, uh, the high school um, students come to a lot of our meetings to get signatures to, or an agenda to make sure that they can show their they get extra. Are you getting extra credit or is it an assignment? Oh, it's an assignment now. Oh. Wow, it used to be extra credit. Yeah. Now it's an assignment. And I think it's really good as a former teacher, but I think it's very good that we get the young people involved in their community, and that's why I do the summer youth program. Do you have to go to all branches? Like, that's what I thought, yeah. Okay, anyone else in city council? Hearing none, I'll accept the motion for adjournment. So moved. Moved? Second. And second. Roll call. Mrs. Rose? Aye. Dr. Ruggles? Aye. Mrs. Sultana? Aye. Mayor Panto? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Ettinger? Aye. Mr. Pinnebone? Aye. If any of you need signatures, bring them up. <laughs> How are you? Much about. Oh, wow. 